Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brazlikum, happy feast day. It's an interactive experience, it's not just with me. Um, not, you know, we're not a spectator type church, we participate together to try to involve. The St. Seraphim of Sarov, when asked why the Christians of his time, of course this is in the early 1800s, do not work the same works as the early Christians, he said it's because they do not have the same resolve as the, same, as the early Christians did. We should not be surprised by that. Society falls and falls and falls and goes away. When the Lord comes, will he find faith upon the earth? We must find that type of resolve. We must dedicate ourselves. The violent take the kingdom by force, we hear the Lord tell us. And Seraphim took that as well as to be forcing our nature to do things it didn't always want to do. When we hear the apostles today, it's kind of humorous on one level, but it is all of us on another level. They didn't quite get it. They'd seen the Lord now for approximately three years. They'd been following him around, seeing his miracles, seeing him feed thousands, seeing him raise, raise the dead up, seeing him heal, but they still were expecting some king of, of glory in this time, in this place, in the here and now. It's rather absurd. They go up and say, Lord, let us just sit at your right hand and on your left. And that is kind of the way we all are, though. We want to sit on the right hand and the left now and have this wonderful time of glory here. But the Lord promises them that he will be baptized with the baptism that he is baptized with, which of course is crucifixion and death. The Lord came and revealed himself by death and crucifixion, not so much by philosophy and teaching, some of that too. But that was when they finally got it, when it was really nailed home. With the traumatic event, they saw God's love in its abundance, that suffering Savior, the suffering servant, who came and died for them, each and every one of them, and then rose, and then they got it at Pentecost. Then they had the resolve to do what they needed to do and didn't flee away anymore. Then they went before emperors and judges and Pharisees and the faithful and the pagans and proclaimed Christ. Then they had resolve. Mary of Egypt had resolve had tremendous amounts of resolve. And each and every year when we hear that life read at the great canon during this fifth week, if you didn't get to hear it, please go find it, readily available, and read it. There's always more we find in it each and every year as our hearts open up, and more that other people find in it. We have new truths revealed to us. Several things that I saw this week that I really probably had not paid attention to or had not struck me in the past, heard one person talking about how in the beginning of the life of Mary begins to speak to Zosimus and she says she rejected her parents' love. It doesn't say she had a bad childhood or difficult times why she turned to this debauchery or needed it. She didn't do it even for money or carnal sins. She rejected the Savior's, I mean her parents' love. We reject the Savior's love. And left them anyway. Seems like a, a precocious, obstinate young girl doing everything she wanted to do and got her way <coughs> all the time. So she leaves her family's home and begins to work her wares and, and <laughs> seduce and tempt many, even for no money, as she said, almost as a sport for herself, wrapped completely up in her carnality, and wouldn't listen to anything. No one can tell her what to do, even when she decides she's going on this trip to Jerusalem to see the cross. There was crowds going. It seemed exciting. Who knows what she thought of the cross? But she wanted to go. And as they mocked her, she said, I'll do what I want to do. I can get what I want by doing what I've always done, by my sin. And she did, and tempted many. And that seems shocking to us. These people are going to venerate the precious cross, but in the meantime, look what they're doing. Grave sin. But is that also not us? 
We say we're going to be great Orthodox Christians, we're going to follow Christ, but we still sin in the middle of all of it. Badly. So we're not that different. Maybe not quite as raucous, but not that different. And she gets there, and she gets to the doors of the Holy Church, and everybody's filing in. But she can't. She is stopped by some invisible force. She can't understand what that is. She says she doesn't know if it's because of her womanly weakness. And she begins to crawl and push even harder, but her legs can't move past the door of that church. For the first time in her life, Mary hears, no, stop it. This is not going to work anymore. You can't do whatever you want continually. It kept her from God. It kept her from grace. And all of a sudden, despite all she'd ever done, covering her sins with her constant distractions and carnality by distracting herself with that, by filling her life up with so-called pleasure, with so-called joy, all of a sudden, every sin that she ever committed came crashing down upon her shoulders in a moment. Oh, that we'd be granted that grace as well. <coughs> and she realized that something had to change. Everything had to change. That is what James and John did not realize earlier, that every single thing had to change. Because of who Christ is, <coughs> He is truth itself, it's not an idea, everything had to change and be redefined by that relationship. She begs at the icon of the Mother of God to help her, he calls her as surety, and asks her to let her venerate that cross, and she will not commit this sin anymore with great resolve. She is allowed then by the Mother of God to enter that church, calling on her prayers to go in and venerate the cross in great tears. Imagine what this spectacle must have been like. Certainly she would have been noticed by the crowd. This was not your average person. <coughs> she goes from there, goes to a monastery near the edge of the Jordan, goes to confession, obviously with great <coughs> repentance, receives communion because of her great repentance, not a normal situation to give someone communion in by any stretch. Crosses the Jordan with the three loaves of bread she had bought, and lives for 47 years in this manner. It sounds like she just had everything on her shoulder. Everything was easy at this point. She just lived in the grace of God. We know this woman that knew the scriptures by heart having never heard them. Walked upon water. Worked miracles. Lived as a bodiless woman. Despite the harsh conditions. But she tells Zosimus that she, for the first 17 years, 17 years is not a short time, was greatly tempted every single day by the thoughts of her former life, by the luxurious food, by the music that she had heard. Reminds me of all the time to say that TV and music and entertainments are not just mindless distractions. They have effects on the soul. We have to be careful about what we put in. She experienced that. <coughs> Everything she thought of, the lust in particular, and she would fall down upon her face day and night, weeping until that sin would be taken away, that thought would be taken away from her, praying, crying out for the Lord's mercy. She didn't just give <coughs> up great resolve, because finally in her life she had been told no. Another aspect of this that was pointed out to me this week was that Mary's personality didn't really change. When we get out of the way, when we humble ourselves and get out of the way that Christ might dwell within us, it doesn't make us into somebody we weren't before, it transfigures us into something far better. She had the same stubbornness, she had the same amount of resolve, and the same amount of zeal for whatever she was doing, she just redirected that love toward Christ, to real love was extremely stubborn with her sins, she would not be told that she had to sin. 
She would not succumb to what the devil told her anymore. She redirected her problems and turned them into grace-filled things and was transfigured. And that is what we ought to do with our lives. We all have strengths. Most of them, unfortunately, not always used for the best. But if we direct them and fill them with the presence of Christ, we too can be filled up with that presence and that love and that mercy and that joy. Life can be radiant. If we had but one thousandth of the resolve of Mary, we would be filled with abundant grace that we probably could not be able to bear. She's a great example for us. But where is my example, we might say, of me coming to the doors and not be going in? I walk in every time I want. Really? Not really. Because what happens is we don't have the prayer we want. We don't have the relationship with God we want. And God sends us afflictions and trials and difficulties. It may not be that wall at the back of the church, but nonetheless, trials that test us and show us God's abundant love that comes through that suffering. Sometimes the most traumatic events in our life are the visitations of God's love because we cannot see God with the pride that we have and God will do everything he can to crush our bones and bring us to him. I mean that in the most beautiful sense. To break our hearts so we might be filled with his love because he knows that we are falling into the abyss without his presence. And he doesn't want that. Now you notice that every time Mary ran from God and we run from God, God never stops pursuing us. He has resolve. No matter what Mary did, God was still there in abundance, day after day after day, working for her salvation. What happens with us, though, is we knock at God's door, we think we do. We pray. We have this burning of heart at moments, really thirsting for God. We all have it. But there's no answer. We feel empty. We feel despondent. We feel despair. Our prayer is not being answered. Why is my prayer not being answered? Why don't I feel the presence of God? But there's a wall there. We don't pray rightly with humility. We pray for wants instead of real needs, for God's will to be done. We pray with a life full of sin. And our sins will block out that prayer. Grace is removed. So it is important to follow those commandments at all times and all places. But also God constantly knocks at our door, whether it be from a verse of the scriptures, whether it be from a service, whether it be from the presence of an individual in front of us that brings God to mind in that moment, whether it be in our prayer life, whether it be in the difficult trials that we have, and we feel that burning in the heart again. <clears throat> we hear him knocking. We know that voice in our hearts. We know what we're called to do. But what do we do? We might even let the door crack open a little bit. But we become the innkeeper. Mary and Joseph, there's no room for you here now. God, there's no room for you here now. Because when God comes into that door, as we see with James and John, and we see with Mary, we sense that everything has to end. Everything has to change. My entire way of life has to change. Because once God has become incarnate, walked amongst us, crucified, and is risen, we can't go about our daily lives as if that did not happen. Oh, we do, but we shouldn't. So we need to remember that resolve of Mary today and be as that woman that walked in the midst of Pharisees and wept at the feet of the Lord and anointed his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Despite what anyone else thought, show resolve from this day forth to serve Christ above all else and let nothing get in the way. Because as much of a burden as some of us think this is, I don't know if anybody that's happy without it, not truly happy. They might think they are, 
But there's no happiness outside of Christ, no genuine joy. So Mary gives us a multitude of examples. She redirects <coughs> her problems and lets them be transfigured. She shows tremendous resolve. She no longer rejects love and embraces real love. It also will not allow sin to come into her life even to the point of virtual death. Because she knows this thing separates her from the Master who brings her into his cross to kiss, to venerate, and to follow with him, not only to death, but into the resurrection. Mary pursued with all vigilance in a way that well, nobody in this room has ever done. Have our own struggles, no doubt. And probably none of us are called to do exactly what she did. But certainly we can learn from the many examples she provides and the resolve that she had to stop sin, to follow Christ, to change her life, to be devoted unto God completely, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to walk with Him no matter what. We can be changed by that today if we but resolve with God's help to follow Him to the gates of hell into paradise. St. Mary of Egypt, pray to God for us. Amen.